Hello, everyone. It's good to be able to uh, resume our study in the book of Philippians, and I invite your attention to uh, that good book. We began last week in looking at the origin of the church at Philippi, and we got into chapter one, and we want to continue right there. Before we do, we want to, uh, again, seem, seems like we're making this announcement about every time we uh, come together. Uh, our national weather spotter has again told us that tomorrow on Thursday, severe uh, thunderstorms are coming into the area, should be with us most of the day. So please uh, keep updated at your local television and radio stations uh, for that information. Uh, before we begin, let's say a word of prayer and ask God's blessings upon our study. Our Father, we're so thankful that we can be your children, that we can come to you in prayer and, and uh, share with you, Father, our, our, our desires, our, our needs. And, and Father, we pray that those things will be attuned to your will for us in our lives. And Father, we pray that in whatever situation we find ourselves in, that we will be content, that uh, as the book of Philippians teaches us, we will rejoice always, and again, we will rejoice. And Father, we are rejoicing today because of the many blessings that you give us. We pray, Father, that we will recognize those and use those for uh, our good and uh, most especially for your glory. Father, bless this word as we teach it. We pray that we'll be able to apply it to our lives to be better servants of yours. Father, again, we want to keep in mind um, uh, Kevin and, and Michaela and Brinley, and we pray, Father, that you would uh, do the most healing good in, in Brinley's situation. And, and Father, we pray that, that nothing will affect her little body that will be of long-term consequence. And Father, we pray that she'll be restored to, uh, to health very soon. Continue to be with us as we live for you. Strengthen us in your word. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. When we look at the book of Philippians, the overall theme is uh, found in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, or again, I will rejoice, resolve, commitment. That's what it means to serve Jesus Christ. That's the kind of servants he wants, committed servants that understand and have confidence in his will. Saving faith, Abrahamic faith. This is what we're trying to, uh, to, to reach in our lives. In, uh, in the book of Philippians, I want to add one thing to that theme. The more I study this, I think we had to, need to add one element to that theme. Rejoice in the Lord always, no matter what. No matter if from our human standpoint, we think that the situation is uh, worthy of rejoicing or not. And, and, and that's no doubt inherent in the, in the idea of always. No matter what the situation is, continually have that uh, deep down joy that we know that whatever state we're in, that the Lord is going to work out everything for our good, Romans 8, 28. And what a great story, an example of Christ being our joy no matter what is found in this great book and even in its context. Do you remember last week we began by studying uh, Acts chapter 16? That is the beginning of the church at Philippi when Paul and Silas were on uh, the second missionary journey. Luke had joined the team at this time, and uh, they, they came to the city of Troas. And it was from Troas that uh, they had to make a decision which way to go. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, look there beginning at verse 6. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the regions of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, keep that in mind uh, for just a minute. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not allow them or permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, 
And then they received the vision uh, in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. The Macedonian call. This is the first time that the gospel was going to go to Europe. And it was going to be a place called Philippi. But uh, an interesting point should be made here. It's interesting where the Spirit did not permit them to go. Notice what uh, these places were. Uh, Phrygia, around the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go. Well, I wonder why. Well, turn over to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. Look at verses 1 and 2. Peter by inspiration, is writing his first epistle to those that were in the dispersion. Remember, uh, the, the Christians here were being persecuted. They were scattered abroad. Notice what Peter says. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Notice where Peter was writing, those same places that Paul was not permitted to go. Do you remember the apostle Paul was called to be the apostles to the Gentiles? Well, when uh, Paul and Silas were going into Macedonia, into Philippi, there were very few Jews there, if any. These were all Gentiles. Well, Paul was called uh, to go to the Gentiles. Peter, as we see in, in the first chapters of the book of Acts, he was called to go to the Jews. And so when Peter is writing his book, he's writing to the Jews in, in this area who had become Christians, but a Jewish background, and he was writing them to encourage them in the faith. But Paul wasn't permitted to go there. It, it's interesting. Uh, when you look more closely at Scripture, many times you will see God's providential plan at work. And so it is in our lives. Sometimes uh, the Spirit, all within the providence of God, permits us to go places and keeps us from going places. The very fact that you and I have met on this earth and we've met in Woodstock, uh, Georgia. Uh, I, I believe very firmly that God's working is, is behind all of that. And uh, it's interesting as we can even see that in scripture. Well, Paul received the Macedonian call to go into Europe about uh, 8050. And, uh, but it was around 11 years later that Paul would write to the Philippians Actually, around the time of Acts chapter 28, during uh, his Roman imprisonment at that time. But in chapter 1, as we see that uh, Christ is our life, the overall theme of the book is Christ is our joy no matter what. Chapter 1 is dealing with the, the idea, the subject that Christ is our joy. Uh, again, no matter what, in whatever situation we find ourselves, in chapter 2, we're going to study that Christ is our example, no matter what. In chapter 3, Christ is our hope, no matter what. And in chapter 4, Christ is our strength and supply, no matter what. Rejoice always. Hear the word always. Uh, whatever state I find myself in, I will be content. Whatever, always, no matter what. So let's add that idea to our theme, not only of the whole book, but of uh, each individual chapter. Well, last week we began with uh, the beginning of chapter 1, and we see where Paul, uh, along with Timothy, are writing, sending this letter to the saints with the, uh, with the elders and deacons at Philippi. And he wishes them grace and peace, and we looked uh, uh, more specifically what was involved in this grace and peace, but I want us to look at the eight characteristics of a Christian. Uh, what are the characteristics of a life that's lived for Christ and in Christ? He's our life. Well, he begins in verse three by talking about thankfulness. 
Christians are thankful people for whatever happens because we know that God's will is at work in our lives. We're thankful for that. We're thankful for blessings. Most importantly, the spiritual blessings of this life. And we need to see a spiritual uh, correlation to every blessing that we receive from uh, God. Every good gift, James said, and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is neither variableness nor shadow of turning. It's steadfast, it's sure, no matter what. Christ is our joy, Christ is our life. But in order for that to be realized, we're going to have to be thankful people. And you see, that was the problem in the Roman world. They ceased to retain God in their minds, they were too busy in their daily lives, and they were not as thankful as they needed to be. We need to be thankful people. But also here in verse number four, we need to be prayerful people. I don't know how many times I have heard, if you want to measure whether or not your life is faithful, measure your prayer life. Paul pray is, Paul's prayer life is a continual kind of uh, occurrence in his life. And this is what enables us to think like Christ, to have the mind of Christ that we'll study next uh, in the next chapter. We are formulating good habits. We are going through a psychological exercise, a mental exercise to keep our minds stayed on Jesus Christ. We do that in prayer and we have a continual rehearsal of the things that we're thankful for. It's interesting as we see these characteristics here in chapter one of a life that's lived in Christ. Many of them build on each other uh, upon the previous one. And so our prayer life is going to be indicative, no doubt, of our thankfulness. And what will that cause? The third characteristic here in verse uh, three, fellowship in the gospel. Right, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, First John, we have fellowship with him and with one another. And that fellowship, that joint participation, either in a physical way or perhaps more in a spiritual way, especially during times of isolation that we can relate to from this chapter because Paul is in prison. We are in a, in a type of imprisonment, not you know exactly parallel, but similar. And here, uh, this fellowship in the gospel will lead to the fourth characteristic of a life that's uh, well-lived in Christ, no matter what. It will lead to confidence. Confidence. It's interesting how God infuses confidence into our minds, into our lives. And it's usually not by the things that we perceive as physically satisfying or gratifying. Those are, those are temporary. Yes, now every one of those good gifts, we need to give glory to God uh, in the receiving of those. But did you notice here what prompted, what caused Paul's confidence? Look in verse six, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of God's working in his life, no matter what. And then in verse seven, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, that God is working in them and he's going to complete his work because I have you in my heart Inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Notice his confidence was brought about by his chains, by his imprisonment. The fact that he was in a Roman prison when he wrote this was not going to keep the word of God from going forth. So it's interesting, it's, it's not that, that God is totally reliant on us in the sense that if we choose not to take his gospel, to teach his gospel, it's not like it's not going to go somehow, some way. God is going to find that way. And even though Paul was in chains in prison, it wasn't going to keep the gospel from going out because Paul would not allow his circumstance 
to circumvent the will of God. He took his less than desirable situation and concluded, how am I best going to serve God? Well, how was that done? He wrote the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon from prison in Rome. So even though he was chained, as he's going to indicate to us throughout this book of joy, my chains are in Christ. Christ is going to use my chains. Now, let me ask this question. What situation do we find ourselves in from a physical standpoint that we're saying, yes, we're in a type of figurative chain here, but how am I going to best serve God? How am I not going to hinder the word of God from going forth in my bad situation, whether it's a thorn in the flesh, a physical uh, problem, or a geographical problem, or sometimes even a mental problem that I need to work on in order to rejoice always and to have God's will not hindered. Listen, God's will is going to go forward whether I decide to be a part of it or not. I might as well be saved and I might as well enjoy all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ by this kind of attitude, rejoice always. Whatever state I find myself in, there uh, in I will be content. But not only thankfulness and prayer and fellowship in the gospel and confidence is characteristic of this life lived in Christ, but in the fifth place in verse eight, look at my attitude toward my brothers and sisters. For God is my weak, uh, witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Notice that there is no insincerity here, no ingratitude, but Paul genuinely, with the affection of Jesus Christ, no, no pretense there. With the affection of Jesus Christ, he longs to be with his brethren. I think that you know the application of this in our situation right away. If you truly have the love of the Lord, you miss each person in our congregation right now. We long, we long greatly to be together, to see each other, and we look forward to that fellowship from a physical standpoint instead of just through a screen or over the telephone, which is the best we can do right now. And we rejoice in that, no matter where we find ourselves. But there's going to be even a greater rejoicing when we see each other face to face. And you know, we say that about our Lord, don't we? And because we don't enjoy that, um, you know, in, in the immediate place fellowship, because our Lord uh, fundamentally, spiritually is in heaven, we are here. There is a way in which we're together and we have that peace that comes by knowing of his presence in our minds, in our lives as we walk day to day. But there is also a difference. You know, we're going to go see the Lord, figuratively speaking, face to face. That's, that's what we long in this life, right? When we're kept apart from each other, if we're kept apart from a family, yes, we can talk, yes, we can Skype, yes, we can Zoom, we can do all these things, but we long to be in their presence. And so we long to be in that kind of presence with the Lord. Paul longed as he was writing this from, uh, from a Roman jail cell, he longed to be with his brethren. Well, that's a part of him that he has developed through his choices of how to think, of how to allow the mind of Christ to be in him. That automatically causes one to long for his brothers and sisters. And I hope that we all are experiencing that longing. That's going to make the reunion with each other 
even better. But there's another characteristic in living life as Christ would have it. Uh, Christ is our life no matter what, even as in verse 9, we grow in, in this love. We grow in this love. Uh, we abound more and more. And that is something that doesn't stop in this life. This love, this agape love, the purest of loves, um, many different kinds of love. And in, in, in our society, in, in, the, in the English language, there is one word that's used and misused uh, uh, concerning love. But many different words in the original language, and this is agape love, the, the love that is done with the mind, the choice that is made, no matter what the object of that love uh, brings to the table. This is, a, this is a, a, an unpretentious kind of love. It's, it, it doesn't compromise with one's desire, but it loves because of the mindset that the Lord wants us to have toward each other. So even though someone is not like me or shares my interests, I can still love that person because I've made a choice to do that. And that's uh, even what marital love is all about. Uh, it's an unconditional love. It's a choice that is made. It's a confident choice that is made and it doesn't end. And so it is with the love that Paul had for his brethren that he couldn't be with uh, under his current situation. He w would pray that the love of the Philippian brethren would abound more and more. Notice this, in knowledge. That's where love ab abounds. That's where love is made. That's where love originates. Just like this is where sin originates. Sin doesn't originate in the act. Well, a, a, a loving act is an outgrowth of where the love originates, and that's in our mind. And he wants this to abound more and more. Notice he even uses the word dealing with the mind in all knowledge and discernment. Why? So you can prove the things that are excellent, the things that are given by God, not the least of which how we're to think about those things. That you may be sincere, right? If we're sincere in our mind, then we're going to be sincere in our actions and without offense till the day of Christ. Without offense. Does that mean we won't sin? No. This offense here correlates with the idea of walking in the light. If we walk in the light, then we will be without offense. Because if we're walking in the light, our offenses are forgiven. They're covered by the blood of Christ. And that can be the case until the day of Christ, until the Lord comes again. So we see the theme developing in chapter one. Christ is our life. And the text, the theme of the first chapter of Christ is our life, is found in verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Everything above verse 21 and after verse 21 have to do with Christ is our life, no matter what. And then if we do, then the last uh, characteristic of this section is the fact that we will be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Now, what are the fruits of righteousness? Well, we know that the fruits of righteousness are the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, uh, those good uh, characteristics that God wants to develop within us, they are of the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, they are of God. So those things we are to uh, cultivate, to nourish, that we may be able to rejoice in the Lord always and live this life that Christ wants us to live. All right, so in this first section, we see the Christian characteristics that need to be in our lives no matter what, no matter what. And then as we go into the second part of the first chapter, uh, Christ is our life no matter what, and Christ is to be preached by our lives 
no matter what. Watch what he says beginning in verse 12. Let's read verses 12 through 18. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Interesting way to put that. And most, not a few, not everyone, but most of the brethren in the Lord, having become, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some also from good, goodwill. Not everybody that preaches, teaches about Christ are doing it sincerely. Some are doing it out of strife to win an argument. Some are doing it out of envy to show themselves out. You see, not everybody has a good motive, but Paul is going to surmise what? The former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, speaking about the false teachers that were you know, prevalent in his time. But the latter, those that are preaching Christ sincerely out of love, agape, knowing where love originates, that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Paul is saying that even though there are preachers and teachers that don't have the right motive, they are still getting the gospel message out. And Paul is at least going to be thankful for the fact that the truth is going forward. Well, Paul is trying here in this section to show them that uh, Christ is their lives no matter what by trying to prevent them from being discouraged because of the things that he had suffered. And he said God was working in them not only to discourage them, but just the opposite, to have confidence. He said most, here in verse 14, had confidence in Paul's chains. You know, when, uh, when people suffer for a cause... It brings them together. It, it, it breeds confidence. When soldiers are fighting together and there is that, uh, that fighting camaraderie, it brings them together. And so it is spiritually speaking. You know, the martyrs would say that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the kingdom. The more you mow us down, the more you put us in prison, the greater we are, the more confidence we have. And so it is, and so it should be, even in our current situation. Even in this isolation, we should be growing spiritually like none other. We have more time to be involved in, in, in the study of God's word and in prayer. We have more time, perhaps, to even communicate with each other through different, more impersonal media than being together. But all of this should be working together to bring about a more spiritual and a more confident situation with all of us, even in our chain. But what about the personal situations in life? A, a thorn in the flesh you might be experiencing, a, a troubling relationship. Listen, there is a silver lining in all of that. There is a good blessing in all of that. There was a great blessing in the worst physical event that ever happened the crucifixion itself. And God brought the greatest good out of the worst event. And God does that in our lives. God is doing that in the life of the Apostle Paul. But we have to train our minds, our spirits to think that way. And this book, like none other in my opinion, does that and does it in a great way. Well, Paul points out that the gospel has progressed not been hindered in his sufferings. Uh, and, and we see that even further when Paul wrote to Timothy. Remember in his last epistle in, in 2 Timothy, 
where he, he writes to Timothy and he is indicating this very thing, that his, his setbacks, his trials, his temptations wouldn't be such that uh, would kill him, but that he, those things could be used to a furtherance of the gospel. And in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, beginning at verse 9, he writes this, For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. And he's using that word evildoer, uh, he's putting that in quotes, as it's being perceived. Uh, Christ was perceived by some who weren't thinking properly as being blasphemous and an evildoer. Many times when we are doing the right thing, people don't assign to us, don't judge to us proper motives. And perhaps we're thought of as evildoers. Well, Paul was thought of as an evildoer here to the point of being in prison and chains. But the word of God, here it is, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore, since it's not, I endure all things, all things I'm going to be content, all things I'm going to rejoice because I know God's providence is at work and I endure those things for the sake of the church, the kingdom, the brethren. Here he says the elect. Christians are elected of God as a group. If you are included in that God, you in that group rather, you have been predestined, you have been elected unto salvation. And so it's our responsibility, no matter what, to remain in that group, to remain in that body, because if you leave the body, you leave the blood. Where special providence resides and where a continual cleansing of one's life resides. Well, he endures these things for the church's sake that they also may obtain salvation. There it is. Which is in Christ Jesus. And the New Testament is very clear about how to be in or to get in Christ Jesus. With eternal glory. He says in verse 11, this is a faithful saying. Watch it. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Here are the interesting uh, statements in scripture that seem to be contradictory. We call them paradoxes, a paradox. For if we died with him, actually we live with him. If we endure these trials, we're going to reign with him. And he goes on to say, if we deny him, he'll deny us. If we are faithless, though, he is going to be re remain faithful. Even we may choose, choose, it is a choice, not to have faith or to leave him. He won't leave us. He remains faithful and he won't deny himself. But it's interesting the context in which Paul says this. It's while he is suffering. I wonder if we have conditioned our mind, our minds to be like this, to think like this, in times of, of isolation, in times of suffering, in times of trial. Uh, we can see this not only in the life of Paul, but when the, uh, the Philippian church was beginning in Acts chapter 16, we see the Philippian jailer in a very stressful situation, wouldn't you say? Remember, as we discussed that last week, how the earthquake came. He was responsible for everyone in the prison. The earthquake came and loosened the doors of the prison, and he thought everyone was gone, and that meant his life. Paul said, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And because of Paul's chain, the jailer is going to feel unchained spiritually, as the situation there brought him to a realization, hey, my physical life doesn't last that long. It's, you know, but a vapor that could be taken away in one catastrophic event at any time. And so he asked, men, what sh shall I do to be saved? The most important question. And that's how chains are lifted. That's how Paul could say, you know, I'm going to glorify God even in my chain. And you and I should be saying the same thing. 
during the more difficult times, that is when I fight harder. That's when my confidence builds in my chain and everyone around us then is affected. We, we talk about how can we, how can we teach? How can we live the gospel? We do it the best in our chain when people see our attitude. That's going to attract them. What makes you think like that? What makes you act like that even in your, in your trouble? What a great, what a great book to remind us of all of that. Well, we should all be mindful that no matter what, our lives are in Christ, that uh, we will suffer for our faith, and when we do, the cause is not hindered, but it's, it's actually advanced. The world can never get this. This paradox and others in, in Scripture, that this is the peace that comes and passes worldly understanding. This rejoicing evermore, a spiritual, if one doesn't have a, the spiritual mind of Christ, can't get this because it doesn't feel good. It doesn't look good. It doesn't sound good. Therefore, it must not be good. But we can see beyond the temporal. And therefore, we can have the peace that passes understanding even under severe persecution and challenges the work of God, the gospel of Christ, continues. All right, then in verse 13, it has become evident to the whole palace guard. Now, it's interesting what was included in this whole palace, uh, the whole palace guard. It was the common hall. It was the governor's courtroom where uh, legal decisions were, were passed. The judgment hall. Uh, everybody that were in these places knew of Paul's bonds. And the way that he projected himself, the way that he spoke and thought and lived, indicated to all in the palace guard that, hey, he believed that he was here by God's will. And it didn't necessarily have anything to do with them. Now, many of them, no doubt, thought that that was you know, ridiculous, but he's going to win people. You know, sometimes we ask, why aren't more being, uh, why aren't more obeying the gospel in our day? Well, maybe it's because we are not portraying this kind of attitude in our day. And most of the brethren in verse 14 understood that uh, this was a providential working of God and the longer this continued, the more confident they got. Well, he said, he then goes into this idea where some were preaching Christ in a less than sincere way. Some were preaching Christ sincerely, but Christ was being preached. Notice, in whatever, in whatever way, in whatever fashion, at whatever circumstance, this was the main point. And when we keep the main thing, the main thing in our suffering, beloved, our suffering is not the main thing. Do you know how quickly that suffering is gonna go by? Now, sometimes as it's compared to this earth, it seems like it's forever. It is not forever. We misuse that term, if, even if at best we're using it accommodatively. Nothing about this life is forever, and that's a major theme in the Word of God. But for whatever time we endure negative circumstances in this life, we need to make sure that in no way will the gospel be hindered by my complaining, by my attitude that seems to project it's all about my suffering. You can hear it in one's speech, you can see it in one's actions, and we choose. We choose which way we're going to uh, handle that. Well, in the next section here in chapter 1, uh, in verse 19, notice the confidence. For I know, Paul says, uh, in, in this, in this uh, section, he is talking about to live in Christ in the flesh is what we need to do, no matter what. And he's making the strong uh, 
uh, suggestion here that the flesh is going to bring about its own challenges. Not that it's inherently evil, but it houses our spirits where the origin of all thoughts come. And sometimes, as Jesus told the apostles in the garden when he was praying, the spirit is willing, the mind is willing, but the flesh is weak. Ever been in a situation like that? We all have, multiple times. And he says that he knows that his uh, deliverance is going to come through prayer and the supply of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. According, here is the confident, uh, the words of confidence again. According to my earnest expectation, for I know this. And we need to be that confident in God's providence as well. Uh, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, all boldness, always, rejoice evermore, always, no matter what the situation. So now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Christ is going to be preached. Christ is going to be magnified, glorified, no matter what. Even if I die, I'm going to die with the Lord on my lips, much like Stephen did when he was stoned. Glorified God in his dying breath because he died like his Lord, even with forgiveness of those that, that caused it. And so here Paul is in prison. For me to live as Christ. In prison, it, it, to live as Christ, and if I die, it's even better. It's gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell, for I am, I am in a spiritual difficulty. This is what the original idea of this hyphenated word here is in the New King James Version, hard-pressed. I am hard-pressed between two, to either stay with them, which is more desirable, or to go and be with Christ, which is more desirable for himself. So he thought he would just take the wise... Uh, uh, the wise position and just let the Lord decide that. Life is in the hands of God and we need to keep it there. Life is a precious thing and God needs to be the captain of our lives. We need to live in Christ. He needs to live in us. He me needs to make the decision. How we are to live for him, he is our master, we are the servants and how long we shall live, we will we will leave that in the uh, mind of God and we won't take our lives and we won't spend our lives wasting it for things of the flesh. Paul wanted to leave, but he says in verse 24, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Notice, Paul was not a selfish person. He understood what life was all about. It was for everyone else, primarily. And so when he got his greatest joy, when he was able to promote the faith and the spiritual lives of others, I, I wonder if that's our greatest joy in life or is our greatest joy looking forward to the next vacation, looking forward to the next paycheck, looking forward to the next whatever of a physical kind of nature. Boy, not Paul, <laughs> not Christ, not the faithful in the New Testament. I mean, their lives, their very lives were given in the cause. Verse 25, here again, here's these, uh, this idea of confidence. Being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. No doubt the Lord had indicated to Paul that he's going to stick around. And the Lord could indicate that to him more directly because Paul was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there was that, at times, a miraculous communication. That your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. There's that spiritual uh, fellowship. Only let your life in the flesh, your conduct, your conversation, your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. How do I do that? By walking in that light, by staying in that direction and portraying this attitude that I'm going to rejoice evermore. That's the manner of life. You know, Christ is our life no matter what. That's the theme of chapter one. All of this is related back to the, 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 uh, the, the text of this chapter, verse 21. 
so that whether I come and see you or I'm, I'm absent, whether I stay in isolation or I'm able to see you, what? When I hear of your affairs that you're standing fast, notice even though they're apart, standing fast in one spirit. Every time you see that word spirit, one mind. And he says, he, he, he repeats it, basically. Here's the synonym, one mind. One spirit, one mind. Same thing. Striving together, one, together, for the faith of the gospel. But I have to have these characteristics. I have to have this mindset that says, whatever state I am, I will be content and not in any way be terrified by your adversaries. See, thinking this way will allow us to be confident with our adversaries, not draw back, which is to them a proof of perdition, hindering truth by my bad attitude or by uh, false teaching hinders truth. It's a proof of perdition. But to you, with the right attitude, it is a proof of salvation. By striving together in the gospel, by having this one mind, by them seeing your right manner of life, that is a proof of your salvation. And that, it's not from any man, it's got to be from God, because man doesn't naturally think that way. For to you it has been granted... Granted, a grant is a privilege. You know, you can have a loan or you can have a grant. If you have a loan, you pay it back. If you have a grant, you don't have to pay it back. It's a privilege. You have been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him or in him, in Christ, you have been granted the opportunity, the blessing of also suffering for him. You see, we don't, uh, in the flesh, you don't think that way. The world doesn't think that way. But we who have exercised our minds according to the principles of the book of Philippians, and especially now this first chapter, think that way. It's a blessed privilege to have, uh, to have war wounds and scars from our service in Jesus Christ. And having the same conflict which you saw in me, Paul says, now you hear it in me. It's a part of me now. Is it a part of us? And I hope that it is. And we are glad for this privilege to so uh, inundate our minds with this kind of thinking to be able to know how we can rejoice in whatever situation. Glorify God the best in our trials, in our isolation, as did Paul. And I hope, and it's, and it's our prayer, that we will all be growing along this line to the furtherance of the gospel, to the glory of God, and one day, when the Lord comes back, we will be more fit for the kingdom of heaven. Thanks for uh, joining me. We look forward again uh, to uh, next Wednesday when we'll go into Philippians chapter 2, and we'll see that Christ is our example, no matter what. And this relates back to the major theme of the book of Philippians. We will rejoice always. And again, we say rejoice. Thank you.